This episode of The Citadel Cafe is brought to you by listeners like you. Visit patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe to find out how you can become a patron and help make this show possible. This is The Citadel Cafe, episode number 435 for Thursday, March 10th, 2022. My name is Joel Duggan, and The Citadel Cafe is where my friends and I hang out to talk about the geeky stuff that we are into. Beaming aboard this week, Alistair McFly is back, co-host of Long Range Sensors, a retrospective Star Trek podcast, at Alistair McFly on all the social media that matters, including Twitch, where he streams from The Citadel, sometimes even with me. Welcome back, my friend. Thank you for having me back. Of course. It's uh, it's great to have you on so often. I know. I was just about to say, I, I, I really am enjoying just the, uh, the the constant returns. It's always a lot of fun. I was actually hanging out with Stephen ESC in person, like could poke him in the arm, although I didn't. <laughs> I should have <laughs> just to make sure, uh, but I, di- I didn't. Uh, and, uh, I've, I've said it before. I'm sure I've said it before on, on this podcast, probably around the Christmas episodes, but, um, during the pandemic and with everyone still being so cautious, even as Nova Scotia is rolling back into some, some lesser restrictions, uh, podcasting is definitely one of the ways that I've been able to keep in touch with friends. And when you can keep Mm. someone in a regular rotation, a scheduled have to hang out and talk about fun stuff like once a month. It makes a difference. It makes a difference as as busy adults because I can my weeks can disappear if I don't pay attention to what I'm doing. And, and for me, like doing this with uh, with you on the podcast and then uh, doing a lot of streaming stuff with Stephen, you know, that's that's how I've kept in touch with you guys as much as I have. Of course, uh, I think that um, the the common ground and now that we've got a lot of the overlap too uh, with the Citadel Cafe and the Citadel Minecraft server, I'm mm. finding that there's a lot more people that I'll run into on Twitch chat that are also listening to the podcast, which is very cool. Because a lot of times uh, they'll say, hey, I-, I love your podcast. And I'm just like, well, I do too. And I'm assuming because <laughs> it's a Minecraft stream, they're probably listening to the Spawn Trunks, which is more than likely how they found me. Uh, mm. And then very often now the the Twitch viewer will say, actually both. And I'm just like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy to hear it. I uh, want to get right into the nerdy stuff this week, though, because we've got an awful lot to talk about. Uh, we are going to be talking about the premiere of uh, Star Trek Picard as the main discussion later this week. So uh, hang on to your butts for that, folks. But first, I would be remiss if we didn't talk about the Obi-Wan Kenobi teaser trailer that dropped yesterday. For once, the trailer didn't drop the day after I recorded the Citadel Cafe. (laughs) Like, because we record on Wednesdays, and a lot of times for whatever Wednesdays are like trailer days, and Mm. very often I'll record something, and like, as I get off the recording, someone will be like, oh, look, there's a new trailer for this movie. It's like, son of a... Like, I really would have liked to have talked about that on the show. Uh, But uh, this came out yesterday, which is great. Uh, I watched it immediately after stream i had somebody pop in to tell me on stream uh chad messaged me immediately uh and his only message was just like kenobi trailer chills <laughs> and i'm just like <laughs> okay that's a that's a good sign because i mean chad and i are big star wars fans but we're also picky about stuff like this mm. and if he had if he had a chill moment then like okay I, I knew i was in for something and you've seen it of course yes yeah when, when i saw it i i had a friend message it to me as well and there was no context it was just um just a thumbnail of it i'm like oh it's kenobi oh that's cool i'll i'll look at that later and then i I think like 30 seconds went by in my head and it was like wait this is a trailer oh god the trailer's out and um you know i'm just kind of looking at it as just kind of almost as though it was just like a shot from one of the previous films or something like that and then suddenly realized it's like okay no no i need i need to, to to dive into this a little bit quicker now, despite the fact that I do this podcast, I don't actually spend a lot of time reading blogs about media and, and releases and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. I had heard that May 25th was going to be the date, but it wasn't until this week, I think, or last week that I found out for sure, like official from Disney Plus, that May 25th yeah. this year is when uh, Kenobi listed as a, as a miniseries, like a limited series. So don't expect seasons of 
of Kenobi. I think we may only get the one, uh, which is fair. I don't know how much of a story you can tell and, and how much of it, you know, you want to spend um, because it has that prequel in between timeline situation where like, you know, nothing happens to Kenobi <laughs> in terms of like, yep. he's not going to die because he's alive in a new hope. Right. So there are those kind of things that you go into something like this. Uh, however, I feel like uh, we've all learned from the Mandalorian, despite that kind of little wedge into um, the Star Wars universe, there are these big gaps between the first trilogy like in um i guess the timeline in terms of episodes yeah. one two and three there's a big gap between episode three and episode four and so we get to follow what kenobi is doing and um the opening scene really reminded me uh of the opening scene in the trailers for uh, force awakens where you've got mm. ray doing all the like the scrapping where she's collecting parts and she's polishing them up it looked like obi-wan was doing the same thing it's a very similar shot in terms of Tatooine, yeah. very dirty, you know, it looks like a flea market kind of idea. Uh, so I thought that was an interesting, uh, interesting thing. But the thing, the 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 note, pardon the pun, that that struck me right away. I recognized a really subtle duel of the fates opening sequence, mm. and then the big chills hit when they actually launched into proper duel of the fates with the Lucasfilm logo drop, like goosebumps right up my arm. And I'm not even <laughs> like a big prequel fan like i like them but they're not my favorite and yeah. and just but that piece of music was just kind of like whoa wait a minute <laughs> that's that's uh that's darth maul stuff going on right there and i like i know we've got darth maul in the clone wars and eventually in rebels uh mm -hmm. so i don't know if we're necessarily going to be seeing darth maul but the trailer revealed sith inquisitors in live action Star Wars, which we have never seen. And I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, I had to pause the video because I was like, there's something very familiar about this. I haven't really seen Sith Inquisitors in the, the TV shows because as we've sp spoken about before, I've not really gotten into those too much, the animated ones. But I've seen enough to have known where those came from. And it's just like, oh, now we're seeing them in live action, which is, uh, which is pretty cool. Yeah, and that that leads me to the only little thing that kind of struck me as that looks kind of funny uh, was the Grand Inquisitor. Uh, I went to IMDb just to kind of double check. Uh, I would mm. warn people that you might want to stay off IMDb for spoilers because when you're looking at characters and stuff like that, if you click too closely or look too closely, especially at actors profiles, it'll list how many episodes they're in. Right. And so you might not mm. want to know that. Uh, or you might want to know you might not want to know which Inquisitor it is because the way that Sith Inquisitors are are named they're usually like the fifth brother or the second sister or that kind of thing they don't have as far as I know proper names um, they have names who they used to be but as far as you know known as Inquisitors they they have these kind of monikers and the Grand Inquisitor is the bald guy that you see in uh in the trailer with the spinning lightsaber which is something else we've not seen in live action star wars uh yeah. and the thing about that shot for me was that i thought his head looked weird and i understand that it's aliens and star wars and you know, aliens can have big heads and small heads and like torpedo heads and all kinds of stuff but it just looked to me like actor didn't want to shave his head <laughs> So they put a skull cap over an awful <laughs> lot of hair and it really looked strange to me. It might be just because it's a straight on shot. If he goes sideways and his head is actually like a much larger skull than a human, then it'll make more sense to me. But for now, I did think he looked kind of like a strange bathing cap with a lot of hair under it vibe. Um, and the face markings and stuff like that, they do. It does pa pair up with the Grand Inquisitor from Star Wars Rebels originally voiced by Jason Isaacs. Um, and they didn't get Jason Isaacs, which is too bad because he's iconic. Uh, but they did get Rupert Friend to play the role. Uh, and he previously played uh, Hitman in the Hitman film. So hmm. um, he's he's creepy. Like he's got the creep down. So this, I didn't recognize him under all the makeup. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Um, but that's a small, small thing because we get to also see, at least I'm assuming it's the fifth brother. 
from Rebels, uh, the guy with the tri-corner helmet, uh, very uh, kind of pretty iconic silhouette. I don't mm. know if it's it's the same character because there's multiple Inquisitors. It could be a different brother. Who knows? Uh, but they they really do um, show a lot of Inquisitors. It is a much more active trailer than I was expecting. Yes. It's also, especially as this is a teaser, it, it felt quite long for a teaser mm -hmm. of this nature as well. Uh, one, one thing that I did love, though, is just the shot of uh, what could only be um, a young Luke Skywalker. Oh, yeah. Pretending to drive a pod razor on top yeah. of on top of the the uh, moisture farm. Yeah. He was sitting yeah. on one of the doors, like one of the archways and pretending that it was he was straddling a, a pod racer and driving. It was really cool. And you got, you know, Kenobi watching him from afar, which is kind of like what everybody knew was going to yeah. happen in this series but you're just kind of like how much of that is going to happen and how can you make that interesting um hmm. joel egerton is back as as um uncle owen so that's cool uh and looks like he's got a decent oh. role like he's he's aware of what's happening some of the sith inquisitors show up it looks like they show up on tatooine and start causing some problems uh i really like the lines that the um the grand inquisitor is speaking i believe it's him uh talking about jedi the jedi code is like an itch like they can't help but do good so by essentially by looking for good fortune and good deeds across the galaxy you will find these remaining jedi and be able to hunt them down uh and i want to tip my hat to straw hat goofy on tiktok uh, a creator that i quite like uh does a lot of movie coverage stuff like that and he mm. was not on board with kenobi at first but he is now uh, not only the, did the trailer get him excited, but he also pointed out that he believes, I don't know the facts on this, but he's probably right, that uh, the woman in the trailer, the the black woman playing an Inquisitor, is the first black Star Wars villain that we've ever had, which is cool. Hmm. Uh, I mean, we've had Jedi, right? Um, Sam Jackson played uh, Mace Windu. Uh, so yeah. like we've had, we've had actors of multiple, you know, backgrounds playing Jedi uh, and of course, different, different bad guys, but like famously uh, the empire is a mirror of like Nazi Germany. Right. And so mm. they're very often in the films played by white people. Uh, and so you don't get a lot of uh, ethnic villains. Uh, and so it's cool to see. It's very cool to see. And I and I, I don't know exactly, but I did pick up on the fact that the Inquisitor that looks an awful lot like the fifth brother, while he's green, he does look like he's played by an Asian actor, which is cool. So I, I'm looking forward to the hunt for Kenobi and how, like, I'm hoping it kind of goes like Jedi espionage, you know, like Jedi spy, you know, kind of hiding in the shadows and and trying to, trying to, um, to out like to to outsmart these inquisitors that are trying to track him down mm. and of course hayden christensen is reprising his role as darth vader you don't see any of that in the teaser i'm assuming they're either leaving that for an in-show reveal or at the very least a trailer and i hope the full trailer doesn't give you the money shot if they do yeah. like a reveal i hope it's like voice only or like a boot you know, stepping into a scene or something like that. Do you remember the shot from the trailer for Man of Steel where his, his boot comes down and the red cape kind of sweeps across the ground? It's, yes. It's a really yeah. iconic shot. Like something like that with like the breathing noise from Darth Vader would be all I would need in a trailer. I, I'd rather see the full reveal, if they do a full reveal uh, of, of Vader in the show, uh, in the show without seeing it in the trailer. Kind of like how it wasn't really spoiled at all for the um, uh, Rogue One. Yes, yes. Like, the trailers never really kind of showed much in the way of Darth Vader. And when we got that money shot in the actual film, it was, that was worth it. Oh, yeah. To, to steal I, that. I think, yeah. I think his, there might have been an over-the-shoulder shot. I, I can't remember the commander's name. It's Fennec, maybe? Anyway, he's a, he's a high up, he's under, he's under Moff Tarkin, but he's a high up mm. um, Imperial guy and he has to go talk to Vader. And I think there's a point where he's standing in the middle of a room and you get like an over the shoulder shot. The shot is focusing on, on him in the middle, but you get to see like the, the side silhouette of like the Vader helmet and the shoulder pad. I think that was in the trailer, but don't, don't quote me on that. I don't, I don't know. I've actually been waiting and meaning to rewatch 
Star Wars, all nine of them. And uh, this is probably going to light a, a fire under my butt to get it done um, before May 25th, just to kind of have a bunch of stuff ready in my mind. Specifically, I want to watch the first three, um, but I've been debating how I want to watch them. I think I might start with Rogue One and then okay. watch A New Hope and then go back and watch one, two, three, and then finish five through nine and go that way. So, cause that the, one of the things like I've re I've watched them so many times that just sitting down and going one through nine in a row, I've done that before. And so because I'm rewatching yeah. them, I want to try something different just to kind of see how it flows. And, and there's always the machete order, but now that we've got so much more new stuff, the machete order now has to account for things like Rogue one. Well, yes. So. And, and the machete order for me too, like I would, I would not consider the machete order as something that I would want to do when prepping to watch the Obi-Wan Kenobi trailer, because that would include chopping off <laughs> one of the films that he's in, you know, yeah. um, especially young. And I, and I think that would be cool. I mean, and, and to wrap this up, McGregor looks fantastic. I mean, he's, he's, yes. he's a little bit older, but he's not, you know, I don't think they're doing a lot of extra makeup on him. He's probably about the right age for this timeline, which is cool. Uh, and I'm excited for it because he, I mean, he's a great actor anyway, but he's, he's got such presence as Obi-Wan and mm. I can only imagine that I, how excited he is about this. Like I, I'm excited <laughs> for him, especially because yes. Star Wars fans can be kind of toxic online. And so far I've just seen ream after ream of like people excited about this because the people that grew up watching the prequels that were kids when they came out are adults now. You know, like these are the people that are mm. 10 years younger than me. So when the prequels came out, when I was like around 2021, 20, they were 10 and now they're 22, 28, you know, like they're in that, that mid twenties range and they're just losing their minds. You know, like the duel of the fates comes, comes on and you see some people jumping off the couch like, Oh no, <laughs> what, <laughs> what are they doing? How are they doing this? And I mean, I, I think that it'll be interesting because I, I did watch Clone Wars. I didn't enjoy all of it, but I certainly watched it. And there's, um, with the rebels and the inquisitors and all that coming together, I think it's going to be really, really cool. I don't think it's going to have the same problems as Boba Fett. I think Boba Fett, while good overall, um, the, the Boba Fett story was not necessarily one that we needed. Whereas I feel mm. like the Obi-Wan story definitely is something that fans are looking for. And that character will feel filled out because it's not a side character. Obi-Wan Kenobi is a main character in the Star Wars universe, right? Yeah. And, and like you kind of alluded to, there is this kind of gap where we kind of know the general gist of what he was up to, just basically living as a hermit. But at the same time, that's a long period of time for him to have done diddly squat. Yeah. So... To, to know what's kind of past that time is uh, is definitely intriguing. And you had let me know that this is not the only trailer that dropped yesterday. No, no. So in addition to Star Wars, we also had Star Trek. Uh, Paramount uh, dropped their Strange New Worlds trailer, which is the new spin-off from Discovery starring Captain Pike and the crew of the Enterprise. I'm excited for this series, but I have to say, trailer did not do anything for me. Well, this to me is kind of what I expected the Kenobi teaser to be, where it is literally a right. teaser and not showing you much at all. And I'm I'm grateful that Strange New Worlds is not showing much at this stage. Right. So that I'm kind of happy for. The the one thing which does feel like overtreaded ground is that it opens with Pike on horseback. We know from uh, the original Star Trek pilot from the 60s, the cage, which had the original incarnation of, of Captain Pike, that he loved horses. So there's a great call back to that. But once again, we have somebody who's potentially left Starfleet and has been asked to come back into Starfleet. And that just seems to be a, a trope that seems to happen with a lot of Star Trek captains. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, That it, it did feel like familiar ground. I tell you what, though, because I mean, and this has been a, a thing with new Star Trek is that every show seems to have brand new uniforms every single time. Um, if, if you love uniforms, then there is just so much variety now. But the new uniforms that they showed off do look far more relaxed. 
And I think that that will lend itself to a more relaxed atmosphere in, in the way that the original series, those look like very relaxed jumpers that they were wearing. Right. And I, I feel that it's a little bit more like that, whereas the other ones felt a little bit more tighter and formal that we saw in Discovery. Well, I remember, too, a lot of complaints from the crew of The Next Generation about how tight the, the uniforms were to the point where it was like restricting actor movement. And, and also uh, it causing Patrick Stewart to have injuries to his back. Right. Yeah, well. I remember that. I remember yeah. that. And I, I like, I feel like I've seen a shot because I've seen a promo for Strange New Worlds that had more Strange New Worlds in it than this trailer did. Um, <laughs> but it was, it was, it seemed like it was more um, promotional shots of like visuals, not, not any real hint as to what the story was or character development or anything like that. And, yeah. and so you bridge shots, you know, Spock, uh, his second in uh, command. I don't remember who, what, what's the name of the character that's Pike's second in command. It's Rebecca Romain. Yeah. So she, she's known mostly as number one and oh. yeah, that, that was in the, in the original pilot, that's all she was known as was just number one. Uh, she does have a name now. Uh, and for some reason it is not on the top of my head. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I mean, it will, but, I mean, we'll find out eventually. It's not important. Yeah. I, I'm more curious about like that number one thing being not, like not originating in like with Picard calling Riker number one. Or is this a common thing across Star Trek that I just don't know about? Picard would always kind of refer to his first officer as number one. Um, and Pike did as well in the very first pilot, the, the unaired one. So huh. uh, it's been there ever since the very beginning, really. Huh. So I think it's just one of those kind of things that some captains will call their first officer and it's just that's something that Picard always did. I mean, it makes sense because depending on the length of the name of your first officer, commander, like whatever, is a bit of a mouthful, <laughs> you know? Yeah. William T. Riker. Yeah. And if you've got more than one commander on the on the bridge, right? That's it. Yeah. So it, it does simplify things. And I love that he calls his dog number one as well. <laughs> nice. <laughs> which is which is always just a, a nice little thing. I'm looking forward to it. Um, not so much because of the this trailer, but because of the other stuff that I've seen. And um, I like how bright it is. Like, I like how colorful yeah. it is. And I'll say, as much as I've been struggling with Discovery, I still haven't bothered to get into the, the latest season. I started it, but since I resubbed to Crave um, recently, I haven't taken my time to, like, finish up and catch up. Mm. Um despite the mood of the show, which I find sad, um, I find that Discovery in general is more colorful than other Star Trek shows that I've seen. Yeah, and it's it, it did start out that way, but it's certainly become more colorful and also a lot more lighthearted. It's not quite as depressing as... Uh, oh, has as it changed? Show. Well, that's good. Yeah, it starts to improve and become more hopeful right. um, as, as time goes on. But that's something I definitely take away from Strange New Worlds is like, it is rainbow bright. Like it looks like 80s yeah. cartoon bridge bright, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's that's definitely a new study that's coming. And especially now that we've got HDR and stuff, I mean, you, you kind of need to embrace the fact that there's so much color options now than we've had before. The, the other thing that I'm looking forward to is just that it's going to be episodic in nature. That, it's, that they will be like a general arc, but it is going to be more traditional storytelling that we've, uh, that we've had in Star Trek uh, that we haven't had with the, the newer series. Right, because Discovery is just one big long season arc, uh, and, yeah. and this is going to be more just like in and out in one episode, similar to like um, TNG. TNG was like that for the most part. That's it, you know. And so, Strange New Worlds, it's going to be like each week you'll be going to a different planet potentially. So, yeah, uh, I like that. Well, speaking of bright colors, we have an email from a quote unquote listener. From Brocket. Yes, that Brocket. Animated series <laughs> Mount Rushmore is the subject of the email. I love to creep into the show via email. Saves everyone listening to me discussing the same things on the show. Uh, Joel and I had a back and forth lately that had me thinking, what are your top four animated TV shows? Your personal Mount Rushmore of animated series. The rules are that it's got to be a series that you've finished and one that is completed to date. Thanks. I'll slip back into the darkness. Wah ha ha. Take it easy, Brocket. Uh, thanks, Brocket, for the message. Um, for folks that are just listening for the first time this week, welcome. Brocket is a co-host on the show. 
he'll be on next week <laughs> and I'm going to grill him about what his Mount Rushmore is uh, so that we can talk about it. But um, I had a hard time with this because, well, one, mm. I was an animator. And as an animator, you just kind of love everything. Um, but then you also love everything for different reasons. Like maybe one of the shows that you watched is beautiful visually, but it's not really the best show in terms of the story. You know, um, yeah. I'll cite something like, or, or vice versa, you know, like I'll cite something like Transformers Beast Wars. I watched it. I liked it. It wasn't my favorite show, but I remember being really into it because it was CG animation, some of the first series of CG animation, and it was Transformers, mm. so it was super nostalgic. But was it a good show? Not really. You know, <laughs> there's a there's a bunch of different factors that come in there. But so the way that I looked at this was I thought about some of my favorite and most influential uh, animated series and also the stage at which I was when I was a fan. And so I broke it down into as a young kid, middle school, and then as an adult. And as an adult, I would like, that's kind of like post, post-secondary. So like out of, out of university sort of deal. Mm. So uh, first as a kid, I would say the one that I liked the most and watched the most as a really young kid uh, was Gummy Bears. I really liked Gummy Bears. I thought that was a great, I remember being really into the story because that by the time they were done in, in 91, there was actually like, a, a bigger story going on. It wasn't just the episode to episode, although that was the big part of it. Um, in middle school and also into high school, uh, Gargoyles, Disney's Gargoyles uh, was was my go-to. Uh, and that was a hard call to make because there's some honorable mentions at the end of this that I have to get into. But Gargoyles from Disney, uh, 1994. Gummy Bears was 1985 for people that are wondering how old i am uh there was a lot of tng cast in that one as well yes matter of fact there was yeah. yeah uh and as an adult uh you're gonna notice a theme and i went over and over i looked at all the different shows because i watched a lot and honestly avatar the last airbender in the early 2000s and the legend of Korra in 2010s like those were the best shows that i've seen as an adult uh, the animation is top notch. The storytelling is top notch. The world building is top notch. Like everything about those shows is 100% worth watching. Um, my honorable mentions are the original He-Man in the eighties and the original Transformers in the eighties. Are they good? No. Were they influential for me? Absolutely. So there's those. The hardest call was the nineties. I, I was down between Batman, the animated series and Gargoyles. And so Batman nearly won it, but then Gargoyles, I just remember feeling like, the, again, the long arc stories, the three episodes or four episodes, you know, season finales in Gargoyles, like I really liked that. And so that kind of eked it out above Batman. Um, my lunch hour all through middle school and even high school, I think was basically Batman and Darkwing Duck once they were in syndication. So Darkwing Duck makes the cut in the nineties. And, and then in the 2010s, it, it, it unfortunately ended with a whimper. But I really enjoyed the imagination and the quality of Troll Hunters from DreamWorks and, and Netflix. So, and we've talked about that quite a bit mm. on the Civil Cafe. So Troll Hunters uh, made, made the cut. A lot of the things that popped to my head were not necessarily good animated series or series that I had seen, but I was going to a lot of films. My brain was going films a lot of the time and realizing, mm. yeah, that was a TV show. But it's like, no, 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 it was a really good film. And then there was like a spinoff TV show, which might have been good, but like, I, I know I wasn't as into it. And um, noticeably absent are Star Wars cartoons, because again, there's some cool moments in them. But as an overall series, I always end up like eye roll checking out in some episodes. So um, I feel like the, the list for me is Gummy Bears, Gargoyles, Avatar The Last Airbender and The Legend of Korra. Um, so what about you? What are your four? Well... Some of my favorites, and, and uh, damn you, Bucket. Uh, the, yeah, right. I, I, I must admit, I do love uh, the the kind of things he comes up with, and not just that, but just the rules that he puts in place. And it's the rules that I find it makes this really challenging because some of my favorites are still ongoing. So shows like South Park, Rick and Morty, you can't even throw Future Armor in there because they just announced that's coming back. So, um, and and there's a lot of childhood favorites that I had that I would watch growing up. And then for whatever reason, in a lot of cases, just getting older and growing out and stuff, I never actually completed them. 
or they switched to a different uh, onto Sky and they went onto terrestrial television in the UK. So there's there's a lot that I feel like I I was gonna put in, and it's like ah, they break the rules though. Uh, so in terms of the four that I settled on. Uh, and I do have some honorable mentions as well, but uh, the four that I settled on was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the 2003 series, which I felt is a lot truer to the feel of the comics, uh, which I did not start with. I, I, I started with the one that we're all familiar with from the 80s, but the 2003 series is really good storytelling. The the characters are brilliant. I was off put at first by the fact that they don't have pupils in their eyes. Their eyes are just white. And I felt that really uncomfortable to watch. And it put me off even watching it when it first came out. But getting into it later, uh, that's one of my favorite all-time uh, iterations, eight incarnations of, of the Turtles. Uh, another one that I watched as a kid, and I was trying to think, in terms of style and things and and influences and one of the shows that was one of the ones i remember being really excited to watch was chippendale rescue rangers and there was just something about i think just the uh the back and forth that you have between chip and dale just their characterizations um and the fact that you had gadget coming up with all these kind of wacky inventions and things and uh one of the standout episodes having a robotic dog i was all about robots as a kid so so that was always a really standout one and that's one that i i watched all the way through because rescue rangers was great um not sure how i feel about the new film that's coming out oh have you seen that the trailer for that yet don't get me started <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it was one of those. Yeah. It was one of those ads that played on YouTube when, like, I had my hands in the sink or something, and I couldn't like get to the remote to change it fast enough. And I just, I, <laughs> man, I was, I was mad. Watch, it's awful. It oh, look, it's it, a, yeah. it's a cash grab BS. Like, I, it's a terrible idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so stick with the original. Yes. Um, another one which. Again, I'm going more for what I felt was most influential. Like, this is a show that has dated itself. It is Canadian, though. Uh, and that is Reboot, uh, made by uh, Mainframe, who did Transformers Beast Wars. Yes. Incidentally. So, uh, and Reboot being probably the first CGI animated TV show. Um, I would say you're probably right. Uh, yeah, it's... That was, that was fantastic to watch back then. And again, as a kid, I was into computers as well. So um, sort of seeing that world was just, it, it did a lot for the imagination as well, um, I think. And my final one, which goes back a very long time. Uh, this one's from 1983. It's a cartoon series, a British one that, uh, that I watched growing up. And it's probably one of the first real fandoms that I could say I got into. Uh, and that's a, a cartoon series called Super Ted. And it's about a teddy bear that's from a teddy bear factory that was a reject. So it was thrown off the production line. And then an alien called Spotty from the planet Spot comes down, takes him away, takes him to uh, Mother Nature, who then casts a spell and brings him to life. And then he becomes a superhero and he can just rip off his fur and he's got a superhero costume underneath. And then he rips off the... <laughs> that's not and, and then he rips at all. Off yeah, and then he, he he rips off the superhero costume, and he's got his fur underneath. It's it's this really bizarre thing. It's always when he says a magic word that you never find out. And he's got a host of villains like Texas Pete, and um, who is as stereotypical as you could imagine. And uh, there's also Bulk and Skull. Bulk's just a big bulky guy. Skull is a skeleton that falls to pieces and can be put back together. And at four years old, this is a fantastic show. Uh, there's not much in the way of violence either. That was one of the, the things when they were making it. Um, so if you have very young kids and you want them to see just a very fun, um, safe superhero show, that's one to, to go with. I, I had toys. I had books. I had, I had the costume at four years old. Yeah, I can see that. Was, I can see, I yeah. can see little kids being really into, into super Ted. Yeah. Uh, spotty. And they phoned in the design on Spotty. That yes, is, they did. That yes. is uh, that is a least effort <laughs> situation <laughs> there. Um, 
I feel like either you've mentioned Super Ted on the show at some point, or you've just told me about it in our conversations over the years. I, I don't know point. which. I know that I've mentioned it to people in my Twitch community. Uh, some of them are from Texas. Oh. So talking to them about Texas Pete and stuff. And uh, the feedback I got was that, like, it's a silly show, but they couldn't stop watching. Yeah. Which I also found very interesting, is you know, with it being a British show, uh, Welsh. It's it's made in Wales. Oh, really? That's uh, cool. Specifically, yeah, yeah. So, um, but yeah, if you have young kids, uh, that's definitely one checking out. And they're only ten minutes in length each oh, right episode. On. Yep, and they're all on YouTube, so you can you could get the whole thing, which is it was really good. Um, and so, I'd probably say for the, my honorable mentions, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles nineteen eighty seven has to be on there. And back when I was in the UK, I knew it as Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles. It was a cut down thing. Uh, it's not as good as Ninja Turtles, I, I will admit. <laughs> yeah. The, the North American version is a lot better. Uh, then the real Ghostbusters from 1986. Yep. That was, uh, that was one that I really, really enjoyed. And, you know, being a big fan of the movies. Uh, there was that. Um, I, I think one of the other ones would be DuckTales, 1987. Uh, which, you know, kind of... I, I, I put it up there with Darkwing Duck. Uh, those were two that I really liked. And another duck-themed one uh, is Count Duckula. I don't know. Have you ever heard of Count Duckula? Oh, yeah. I've heard of Count Duckula, and I remember the show. I used to watch everything. So, like, when oh, I... Oh, interesting. Okay. I mean, one of the, I mean, I had a hard time deciding, you know, the younger years. Like... I mean, I was a huge Ninja, Ninja Turtle fan. Like, G.I. Joe mm. missed me entirely. I just, whatever reason, I was not yeah. interested. It was it was Transformers and then Ninja Turtles. And Ninja Turtles were like the last real ream of action figures that I owned before I grew out of buying toys. Uh, yeah. And, and yeah. moved on to Lego or, or just, well, essentially, I think at around age 10, I got a Nintendo Entertainment System. And then any money I had was spent on video games. But <laughs> I remember playing the Turtles video game. Like I was still very much into mm. Ninja, Ninja, Ninja Turtle. Um, but um, I do remember Count Duckula. I don't remember the cartoon specifically. I remember DuckTales, Rescue Rangers. Um, what was the other one? Um, that was in syndication. Ghostbusters and syndi Ghostbusters was like after after school, um, and then right. early on, I was trying to decide like Muppet Babies, Gummy Bears. Yeah. Um, the thing, and this is the thing, it's not necessarily a series. They were never intended as a series. But my favorite cartoons as a kid, which don't meet Brockett's criteria, they weren't a series. Is uh, Looney Tunes. Um, and they yeah. were they were presented yep. as a series on Saturday morning, like re like reformatted and collected into like you know Roadrunner cartoons or Bugs mm. Bunny cartoons or whatever. But originally they were meant to be shorts shown in front of films in theaters. And so um, I've got many of them on DVD, an old box set that I have when they released them uh, for like a third. I can't remember what anniversary it was, fiftieth anniversary, something like that. Uh, mm. Anyway, those are my favorite cartoons. But they're not series. Like, they're not, like, the same yeah. as Gummy Bears. And, and, man, like, when I was going through the list, Disney was just everywhere in the 80s and the 90s. Like, even on TV. Oh, I know. Just everywhere. Yeah. That, that's what I was, when I was trying to sort of limit things, you know, like, Rescue Rangers became sort of the, the main one, and, and DuckTales uh, as well. Um, but, yeah, there, there was just so many to choose from. And Count Duckula, when I was a kid growing up, I thought that that was kind of Disney because, again, it was an animated duck, but... That is a British show, and and that's why I was curious if you'd seen oh, it. Really? I don't know if it made it out here. Oh yeah, yeah, it's British. I, I don't know. Castle Duckula. Oh yeah. yeah, okay, you're right. Yeah, that doesn't look like a Disney thing at all. I do remember it though. I, yeah, I mean, it must have been on syndication here somewhere. You know, yeah. over the over the years. Yeah, it was a spinoff from another British show called Danger Mouse. Okay, I do so remember. I do remember. I do remember yeah. Danger Mouse. I do remember yeah. Danger Mouse. Do you remember Mighty, yeah. Mighty Mouse? Oh yeah, yeah, Mighty remember Mouse Mighty Mouse as well? Yeah. yeah, with the little yellow and uh, yellow costume with red cape. And and for was. me, four year old Joel, it was the original Hercules. That was the cartoon. Oh, interesting. Okay. That I that I was into for superhero. We're talking like, uh, it was in the eighties or maybe the seventies. So you're kind the of going from the Hercules mighty Hercules, to man. Yeah, That's, the mighty Hercules, that, that, uh, produced yeah, in the sixties kind of... actually, but probably in syndication in the eighties. Right, yeah, and and that's the thing. Like syndication, 
a lot of uh, shows that I remember watching growing up as a kid wouldn't have been made like but you know weren't airing at the time they'd been made it was certainly a few years after yeah for for that uh the the final one that i have in my honorable mentions is one which is not the kind of animation style that i really like but the show just got me and um i really fully enjoyed it and that was invader zim oh that was on i want to say my first year university and it killed us I, me and my <laughs> me and my roommates were ju- we would laugh until we couldn't breathe just oh, between it, between zim and yeah. Gur. like i just yeah that was a great show yeah it's, it's such a shame that one got canceled it really is they but, brought it back for like another season or a special spinoff they, or a movie or yeah. something like that but but it yeah. wasn't a, it wasn't as good um i just really liked the the chaos of it it was just bananas mm. uh the some yeah. other ones that we really liked as like adult swim cartoons were the oblongs and um undergrads which was canadian made i think it only had one or two seasons maybe even just one um but under I've undergrads was, of them. Un, you would like undergrads undergrads is yeah. like um for a specific canadian age group usually around my age or a little bit older between like you know 40 to 50 or or even 40 to 46 or 47 um people that were in college in like the late 90s and early 2000s um that was a staple and there's so many in jokes so many in jokes like um you, you could i could do an impression from that show which i won't do now but i i could do it <laughs> and there if i was in mixed company a number of people i'm sure would be just like they would smirk <laughs> you know like they they would know exactly exactly what what that's from um but there's definitely some st- some archetypes uh, and stereotypes in that show that i think you would find pretty funny nice I, i'll definitely have to check that one out Moving into the main discussion this week, we're going to talk about Picard season two, the premiere. If you have not seen it, I don't, there's not a lot of spoilers, but there's some fun moments that that Alistair and I might talk about. So um, if you haven't seen it, then just going to be forewarned that we're going to kind of pick apart the, the first episode here. Uh, I'm going to be continuing to watch because I enjoyed the premiere quite a bit, but you are a much bigger star trek nerd than i am so like in terms of first uh-huh. impressions yes imagine that um wow. mr long range sensors <laughs> uh if so for first impressions like i'm curious to get your take on it oh first impressions hands down i loved it i i think that they've um it, it's falling on from what we've had as a traditional thing with star trek which is that the first seasons are always really rough and trying to find their feet and just from the ground running this one definitely has found its feet um we have characters which don't even need to go through like a massive introduction they you know you're you're just kind of catching up with where everyone's up to and and getting into things and and really getting into the core focus of who picard is and kind of catching threads that we'd seen a little bit in next generation and kind of makes sense to to follow on now and it's almost like the last remnants of um uh, of struggles for picard especially when it comes to the idea of relationships and family i yeah i i agree with the pacing it was nice to just touch base with all the main characters that you got to know in the first season Hmm. um sometimes in like action sequences like seven or or more somber moments between Picard and I can't remember his commander friend, um, the woman. She's in a uniform now. She wasn't when we first met her. He had to convince her from the trailer to come on a trip with him. I can't remember her name. Um, oh, uh, yes. Uh, you uh, are talking about um, uh, Rafi. Rafi, right. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and um, then you get like Gerardi and um, Rios and all those kind of reunions and stuff like that. And it's pretty funny because like, Gerardi, you kind of pick up um with soji and i don't even know if we're going to see a lot of soji in in this season that the way that it yeah, goes sure. at the end but... of the episode it kind of feels like what well, that's the only my only reservation so far in terms of the story and where they're taking it uh despite the fact that i don't like q and this is this was in the trailer it's not a big spoiler but um essentially there's a, a moment at the end to skip right to the uh, the, the very end of the, of the <laughs> show where q shows up and has either has gone back in time and changed something and now the federation is like a totalitarian regime so like 
future apocalyptic doom. Like we haven't seen that enough sci-fi already. Um, ah. But, uh, and I wish I hadn't done this. I think I was away from the controller. So like I didn't pause the viewing. And at the end of the episode, they do like a trailer for the rest of the season. And they go back in oh, time. I, I didn't. I didn't catch that. Oh, I, I, sure. So I, I've, should I, I've should seen... I not say anything? Oh no, no. Oh, I I have seen it. Maybe the trailer that they already released. They I did think have it a trailer that was for the the show. There was um, a scene of them driving a car and on a bus. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So I, I have seen the trailer. I just okay. didn't see it straight after the episode. That's anyway, so they go back in time. Um. So the whole thing, and I'm glad that I've got you on the show because the whole thing smacks of Back to the Future Two. <laughs> <laughs> right like uh biff goes back in time makes a, a, a bet becomes a, a very rich individual and then the future is just terrible because this awful person has all this money and power and and all of a sudden we don't know the ins and outs but it looks like the federation is this totalitarian evil organization and mm. it's because of one thing that uh q changed in the past in like 1998 or something like that i can't remember the, the exact year but no 2024 they go back to just uh, beyond where we are now um i i do wonder if it was q or not though well okay so i the, all of this is kind of like this is how it's presented. It might be the trailer yes. might be misleading yeah. on purpose, but they, I, I'm 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 just going off what we know of Q. Yeah, um, and how he's done things in the past. Yeah, exactly. But anyway, yeah, um, and this is where I defer to you because you know a lot more about this than than I would. Because I've seen TNG, but once, and then mm. bits and pieces in syndication, but never like have I sat down for like a full second viewing as an adult. It was on syndication when I was in university so i wa i watched it um and then they switched and voyager picked up syndication so i was i watched more voyager i think than i did tng which is weird because i like tng better i think um mm. anyway uh so they go back it looks like they're gonna go back in time which is like that's a, there's always a fun kind of like fish out of water moment for like these future tech people to come back to like 2024 and just try to figure out how to drive cars and and you know how violent 2024 is and all this kind of stuff there's a couple of bits of social commentary so i mean i think it's going to be a fun watch as long as we don't have picard doing yeah. a french accent again then i'm i'm I'm, all, I'm okay with that um but i really enjoyed the the pace of this i there's some yeah. really fun moments when um picard has got some soul searching to do um because he's presented with a potential love interest which um i only know because i've seen him on a couple of interviews uh where he's been talking about like what to expect from picard season two and he doesn't give mm -hmm. in any plot hints but what he does say is that something that we've not seen come to a full story for picard in any of the seasons has been a a love interest that's a staying love interest so he was you know curious to explore that and uh the one it looks like they're pointing us towards uh laris uh, a romulan um companion that he has on the the homestead as mm -hmm. as his love interest orla yeah. brady is the actor i yeah. Porsche bon <laughs> what's uh, that Porsche bon who uh in the year between season one and season two has somehow died who was her partner he right. was he was the other romulan that was uh that was living with uh with picard and he he's died somehow we don't know how but just he's gone uh which he would have to in order for them to take that path uh, for picard and laris really and i'm not 100 percent on board i i don't it's a pretty standoffish moment. They might give more as time goes on, but I just, for whatever reason, I'm just not picking up on a lot of chemistry between the two. Uh, it's well, maybe because I don't remember any chemistry from the season one. Yeah, um, I, I think a lot of it is going to come down to the history for Picard when it's come to relationships, and even um, even Guinan touches on yes. that. That the the few relationships that he's actually entertained have been ones that he knew would be temporary. And that wouldn't last, and he's definitely been burnt by things before. And in Star Trek Generations, he was in the Nexus and had a family, and so he, there's definitely been urges for that. He's lived an entire lifetime as somebody else in a great episode called The Inner Light, where he learned the Mexican flute. So he's had experiences of things, but there's always been that feeling of there's something that's been holding him back from making that commitment, and I think that. We saw just that hesitation in full force 
where the opportunity is right there for him. And that's where my and that's where my interest lies is less with the love interest modern story, but more with the reveal of Picard's past and why yeah. emotionally he's so independent. And um, it looks like they're pointing, at least in part, to his relationship with his mother, which I think yeah. is going to be interesting. Because I like again, because I'm not like a super in depth um, Star Trek nerd. Uh, I don't know an awful lot about Picard's past and what hints they dropped in the next generation. I don't remember. Like I pfft, like just, yeah. you know, all that stuff that you just mentioned news to me, you know, I'm sure I've seen the episodes and I would remember them if I watched them, but I don't, mm. it's not something that's ingrained in my memory of the character. Um, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I, I do feel, and I don't want this to sound like a detractor. It's just out of fandom concern I do feel like I'm starting to notice how old Patrick Stewart is on, on screen. It's, it's not a bad thing. It's just an mm. observation. And it just makes me like, just, I hope he's a, a healthy <laughs> individual. Cause I really enjoy his work and I really enjoy him yeah. as a person. He's hilarious on ch shows and he does so much good in the world and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and he's such a, he's such a modern, you know, um, person for, for his age. Uh, but I, I do notice, and this could also be acting, you know what I mean? Cause I don't, I don't really necessarily feel like he, he's that old when I see him in interviews, but yeah, well, because of Picard being at least a hundred years old, I think. Um, yeah, he, he's supposed to be like, tw I think it's 20 years older than Patrick Stewart is. Right. Right. So he's into his, into his hundreds now. So there could be some acting there to make him feel older, which you know, bravo, <laughs> you're making me concerned for your well-being, <laughs> you know, so obviously it's working. Um, but uh, the thing that I don't remember, and you can maybe clarify this, is at the end of season one, Picard mm. dies biologically. Yes. And then they put him in an android body, right? Yes. And that android body, if I recall, is also aging? Uh, yeah, so it, that's supposed to still be able to age and will have a finite lifespan as well. So he's not going to just live forever. Right. Um, e even um, like, like one of the things with the Soong type androids is that they were designed to be able to age as well. Uh, right. You even end up seeing Data's mother, uh, who was recreated as an android after she passed away, and her body was designed to age over time as well. So she didn't even know that she was an android. Right. Okay. So that that's I'm 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 my brain remembered that correctly. Yeah. The other thing is that um he's just been kind of like re he's he's been moved into this android body. So everything's the same with the exception of course in that the disease that killed him is no longer there. So he just gets to live out his life as if he didn't have well, that disease that killed him. Well, one thing that uh, that came to mind whilst I was watching the episode is that that's not the only thing because he also has Borg implants, which right. he's not going to have anymore. Right. They're not going to have transferred Borg implants into there. So uh, there is a scene with him on the bridge. They see the ship come through the rift, and he turns right. to Seven, and he's trying to get confirmation, because if he had those implants, he we know, know from first contact, he would have known for a fact that was the Borg. He, knew the, he could sense the Borg before they were even in the sector before. Right. Uh, whereas he was having to look to Seven for, for that confirmation, which is really quite intriguing that, that, that he's kind of lost that sense that he had before. I, I knew they were going that way. Like, I, I knew they were going that way just from the color scheme of the, of the anomaly and, and the yeah. shape, even though the ship wasn't a cube, just the texture of it. Like, it, it just good, good design, like good, good design mm. consistency, even though it was a completely different shape between the colors and the texture. I just kind of went like, that's Borg. You can't tell me it's not. If you tell me it's not, I'm going to call you a liar <laughs> and I will be right in three episodes <laughs> when you all discover that it is Borg. <laughs> you know, like, um, so I, and I was, and that's the thing, like, I'm excited to see where that goes, but then just all of a sudden Q shows up and flips everything. I was like, son of a gun. Like, I just... And I don't know if I want to be flipping back and forth between like a, a current timeline or a past timeline. Like, I, I don't know where they're going with it. But mm -hmm. I, I also know that um, Patrick Stewart would not sign off on, an, on a dumb season. Like, you know, I feel like he would be very much involved. And so I, tr well, I liked season one. I trust the process. I'm, I'm on board. I think it's going to be pretty cool. Well, one of the other things was the, with regards to that is that the, they 
have just, in fact, they finished just, uh, was it yesterday? Maybe a couple of days, I can't remember what it is. But um, Jerry Ryan recently posted on Twitter that they've just finished filming season three. So kind of weird oh. that they've just wrapped production there, but season two is just starting. Uh, and that is the final season. Oh, okay. Um, so it is a finite story. Um, so we've got season one, two, and three, beginning, middle, end. And a lot of stuff in season two is setting up for things that will get wrapped in season three. But it's also good knowing that we've got this kind of contained story that yeah. you know, is going somewhere and that they know exactly what they're doing with it. It's the kind of thing where like, it's cool to know that sometimes, but it actually like, it also removes any peril for, well, at least for Picard. I mean, you don't know who else might or might not make it to, well, obviously seven. <laughs> you know? um, yeah. But well, then I guess, I mean, if you're dealing with time, like an actor could be in season three but they might die in season two and it could be a flashback or it could be, you know, uh, they could be playing different characters. Cause I know Brent Spiner is in season two, but he's not playing the same character he was in season. Uh, no, he's, I don't he's think... being one of Soong's relatives. Yeah, exactly. So stuff like that. And I'm trying to stay out of the spoiler zone. Like I'm trying to stay off of IMDB uh, and just try and um, kind of see where it goes naturally. Cause hmm. it's very rare these days that, you know, you can be a fan of something that isn't like, something that you have to avoid entirely on the internet. I don't feel like Picard fans in the same way that Marvel and Star Wars and all that kind of stuff, they just don't get out and start spoiling things like the moment it comes out. You know, if you're watching yeah, I, or listening to something, you might get spoiled. But like, if, you, if you're not seeking out spoilers, you're not going to get slapped in the face with Picard spoilers the next day. You know what I mean? That, that's it. So I, and that's one thing that I, I truly enjoy is just be able to, to wake up in the morning, watch Picard and... I, I, I've not had anything spoiled. Even things kind of coming down the line, there's, you know, there's usually good disclaimers so that you can avoid it quite yeah. easily. That reminds me, when yeah. does it come out? Is it Saturdays? Uh, Thursday, so the new one's out today. Oh, sweet. Okay, cool. I know what I'm watching after this. <laughs> uh, we're recording <laughs> in, We're recording first thing in the morning for people that are, that are wondering, why are they only talking about episode one? Because I watched episode one Saturday night. Saturday night. And that actually brings mm. me to the only real negative that I have about my experience. And it doesn't have not have anything to do with the show, but it has a lot to do with the total shit streaming quality from Crave. Uh, I was disappointed immediately after spending $20 plus tax uh, Canadian for Crave, which includes Picard and a lot of sci-fi stuff, but also HBO content. It only streams in 1080p. I know for a fact that HBO stuff has been more than 1080p. So Crave do have content in 4K. Star Trek is only available in 1080p. It is, uh, they film Discovery and Picard, they film it in 2K, and they do so in HDR, so it's in Dolby Vision. And they'll downscale it to HD for release. So even Paramount Plus in the US, they're doing it that way. Uh, Netflix in the UK, um, for people there, they'll notice that it'll say Dolby Vision for something that's in 4K, but it's HD Dolby Vision for Discovery and Picard. Um, but a lot of, uh, there's apparently, and this is just going from what I've seen on Reddit, from people chiming in who are industry professionals saying that there's actually a lot of 4K stuff that was filmed in 2K and is upscaled to 4K and people can't really tell the difference that much. Now 1080p, mm -hmm. obviously there's a, a much there's a much bigger difference there, but because they're focusing more on the HDR side of things with Dolby Vision, that gives you far better picture quality overall because you're getting a much better range of color. And that's a little bit more important. And I would guess now this this is not coming from what I've read online. I uh, I don't fully know but my guess would be that the cost involved to make a series like that with the amount of special effects that they have and to do those rendering in 4K is going to be very different. I, I, it's, you still have to do the special effect, whether you're rendering it in, in one form or another. Um, I, it could generate some costs, but I don't think it's going to be that substantial. Uh, but it does bring me back to my point. I'm thinking more time. Yeah, <laughs> it, it does because maybe, that, but you know, more time will be. Make but it in more terms expensive. of my experience, I'm not talking about the quality of the Ooh. show. I'm talking about the quality of the stream. And if you're only streaming it in 1080p, then there's no reason for that stream to be jittery. And yeah. 
I know that a lot of people will say, you know, as an excuse, well, your internet, you know, isn't fast enough. Mm -mm, no, I have a hundred megabit symmetrical and I stream 4k stuff from Disney seamlessly. Mandalorian looks amazing. It's not me. It's not my box. It's not my TV. It's, it's not anything there. I have the same internet connection and watching it on Cray for me was buttery smooth. So I do wonder, uh, unless, I mean, I don't know if it's just perhaps they can't handle the bandwidth on a Saturday night. Possibly. I don't know. I mean, I'll try it again. But like I said, the, the stream mm -hmm. was jittery. The amazing sweeping reveal of the Stargazer was total crap. Like it, it was bouncing around and that's where I gave up because I realized it ruined that moment for me. And uh, I, I went and I, and I watched it another way. And, and in a way that should have been <laughs> choppier or less reliable, it was smooth. And he was like, come on. Anyway, <laughs> we'll, we'll see how it goes. I, I have reservations like this about uh, the, the Rings of Power coming from Amazon in September. I, I've not had good experiences with Prime streaming either. Uh, and I've got a couple mm. of different ways to check, right? Like I can watch on my iMac, I can watch on my Xbox, I can switch over and watch directly on the smart TV instead of going through the Xbox. And uh, the difference with the Xbox is normally I'll get like a gaming HDR on the Xbox or I'll get a Dolby, you know, Atmos HDR on the TV, depending on which service is offering what. Uh, and honestly, like, it, it sometimes the Xbox apps are not the best. Like I prefer to watch uh, Prime on the TV. I find that the Xbox Prime app is not very good, and it te it seems to be pretty pretty jittery. Whereas if I watch it on on the TV app, it's it's not so bad. So I know that there's a lot of factors in there, but it was really it was really really frustrating um, for that. Um, the only other thing that struck me funny, and and you might be able to to speak to this, when the borg queen i guess i don't know there's some hooded yep. figure arrives um they don't show their face at all on the bridge of the stargazer and start like sticking tentacles of digital stuff into into the different consoles there's a moment where a firefight breaks out even after captain rios had said like don't shoot and i'm correct me if i'm wrong i'm pretty sure that the crew opens fire without command and then is given the command to stop firing and doesn't listen. They still continue. Yep. It, like that struck me as really strange. Yeah, that that's I find odd as well, because if they're doing their job, then they should be listening to the captain's orders. Yeah, it just it struck me as just weird for Star Trek. Like it, it, it felt out of place. And I mean, it makes sense that they would be shooting at this thing. But mm. at the same time, there was someone that screamed out that that the Borg presence was stunning people, not shooting them. So yes, yeah. there was there was some threat there, but it wasn't there to kill everybody because it obviously could have. Uh, and then you can't make drones from uh, dead people. Exactly. There you go. Okay. <laughs> so I, yeah. I think that might be a worry that, yes, even though they're not being murdered, yeah they you know if they're being stunned well they could still be assimilated that's fair the the other thing is um i don't remember and you might did seven fire first and then everybody else join in i don't Ooh, remember uh it's been a few days now so i can't recall if she she certainly was like she drew a need weapon to first. do this yeah she she was like we need to attack first but i can't remember who fired the first shot Anyway, that, that whole moment did strike me as, as a bit strange, but, but it took a slow but enjoyable episode to a high octane ending. And, yeah. and that's where I was like, okay, it's, we've still got some legs like this. This is not going to be a bunch of, um, following Picard shuffling around talking to friends, right? Like it's going to have a lot mm. more to it than, than that. So, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a, a fantastic show. Yeah. Same. Moving on into the Internet Minute, which is, of course, brought to you by you, dear listener. The Citadel Cafe is listener supported. If you are getting value out of the show, please consider a little bit of value going back in. You can become a member at patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe. Joining at any level will get you an invite to the member only Discord server 
and access to the Barista Cut bonus audio sessions. Patron count is at 25. That is up one from last week. Our goal each week is to have at least one more patron than the week before. If you would like to be patron number 26, visit patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe. I don't have a pick this week, but you do. I do. So tell me, Joel, do you like food? I do. Do you like cooking? Also, yes. Well, I discovered a channel recently, so new to me, not a new channel, but new to me, uh, called Sorted Food. And they typically have a chef, and the rest of the crew that are there, they refer to as normals, which I find quite uh, entertaining. And one of the things that I love is that not only are you getting to see, you know, a, a very talented chef, along with some less talented chefs, but, you know, people who are just... You know, average day-to-day -day cooks, um, you know, as you would do at home. They will also do so by reviewing technology. So they'll get really expensive kitchen equipment, and you get to see what it's like to actually use it properly, and I find that fascinating. And the first video, and this is the one that, uh, that I'm really linking to today, was them reviewing the world's most expensive toaster. Now... How much would you spend on a toaster normally? I don't know, but I was just having this conversation with a friend recently as we were discussing like, you know, upgrading kitchens and things like that. And I hmm. don't know how old my toaster is. That's how old it is. I'm pretty sure <laughs> that it came with me to this apartment. So like, it's been a long time. It's a Betty Crocker. And I only know that because I looked the other day during that conversation, but it's a four slice <laughs> toaster. Uh, which I used to use all the time, but now I, I, you know, I only ever use really two sides cause I, you know, I, I live alone, but, uh, mm. at, at certain points, especially with roommates, cause I did have a roommate when I first moved in here years and years ago, having a four slice toaster just made breakfast and stuff like that, that much easier. Um, but that, or if you're cooking for friends or anything that requires a toaster. Um, but I have to say that as I've been watching more cooking shows and picking up more tips and tricks and things like that, especially mm. if I'm having a nice dinner and I want some nice toasted bread to go with the dinner, I don't toast it in the toaster. I'll toast it in the oven or mm. if I don't want to turn on the oven for just a couple pieces, like if I'm toasting like a baguette, I'll put it in the oven. But if I'm just toasting a couple pieces of bread, I butter it and I'll toast it in a frying pan. The thing I love with this is that you have a very talented chef who goes through all those different ways of toasting. And so he knows you know, how to do it with different types of breads, different styles. So he's able to put this really expensive toaster through its paces. It is 300 British pounds, which is about 500 Canadian dollars. Oh, no, there's no way. That's just stupid. <laughs> right? So he goes through like, and so they're, they're basically trying to figure out like, is this completely stupid or can it actually do better than a normal toaster and all these other methods that you can do um and uh, watching that one is my first one i just found it absolutely entertaining i've been watching a lot of their other um episodes that they've got where they've been reviewing other technology or they'll get food kits and they'll review those um you know ones that are from you know from full-blown restaurants and stuff it's it's a brilliant series with uh you know quite a lot of humor between the the crew on there and and worth checking out it's funny the price tags that are attached to things and so much of it is marketing. The um, the series that I've seen a couple of times scroll by on TikTok and I don't follow this creator so I don't remember their names but it seems to be kind of like an organization of chefs and they review kitchen utensils and they were talking about cast iron pans and uh, carbon steel pans which comes up a lot on, on TikTok and the cooking videos that I watch and yeah. they reviewed a bunch of carbon steel pans ranging from 30 to 40 dollars you know 100 dollars, all the way up to like 350 for some like this is they, this company claims that this is the best carbon steel pan that you can get and mm -hmm. they put them through the paces they did eggs they did like they did all these kind of things they made a special dessert in it like that was like an apple turnover thing that's like sticky and it's got they did like tomato sauce in it so it might like the high acidity cooking they did all these different things and what I find so interesting and entertaining and uh, rewarding at the end of those videos is that they'll say, is the $300 pan the best pan out of this bunch? Yes. Mm. However, the runner up, which is like nearly as good was 40 bucks. So like, do you need to spend $300? No, you really don't. Like you, you would be better off to get yourself three of these $40 pans of various sizes 
and could be completely kitted out in your kitchen for half the price of one 12 inch carbon steel skillet. And I, I love information like that. I love that they can yeah. say like, is it the best? Yes. Is it worth the $300 when this other $40 thing is on the market? No, it's not. I love honesty like that in, in social media and reviews, especially because these are, I mean, like as far as I can tell, these people are all chefs. I, I don't know why mm. they would come on and lie, but you know, like if you want to take it at face value, it seems, you know, straight up. Yeah, I, I think you'll love the sorted food guides and, and they, they buy the stuff themselves. It's not stuff that's given to them. They will actually go ah, spend their own money nice. yeah. to actually see what's, the, what's worth it. And they, they go through very much the, the, the same kind of thing. And it's also one of those things where you could spend, you know, hundreds of dollars on something. If you can't really cook well and you don't know how to use it, you're not going to get the value from it. Whereas if you spend less and you learn how to cook with it properly, you'll get way more from it. And I, I just find it fascinating just watching people who know what they're doing cooking and how to use these things, not just using them to their potential, but also pushing them to do things that they're not designed for. It goes back to the thing that you talked about a couple of episodes ago about um, Adam Savage and his rule about tools. You know, like yes. go out and buy a cheap tool and then when you destroy it or realize that you use it every single day, then save up and buy the best version of that tool that you can afford reasonably. And you'll hmm. be so much better off because you know what tools you bought cheap, use three times and only touch once in a blue moon. You don't want to spend yeah. a lot of money on those, but the ones that you use every single day, like I, I use my cast iron pans like almost every day. And so I've got a couple of really nice cast iron pans that I take really good care of because I use them constantly, you know, hmm. um, pots and stuff like that. I, I've managed to have some, some nice pots gifted to me for Christmas a few years ago. So I try to take good care of them, but there's a bunch of other things that I don't even think about, like my toaster, you know, kettle, you know, like I, if those things go, I don't go buy anything crazy expensive. Like I just buy a replacement that works. Cause like you're boiling water, who cares? You know, like just <laughs> stuff, stuff like that. You know, like I try not to put too much, too much thought into it. Well, that wraps up this episode of the Citadel Cafe. You can get more information about the show and links to some of the things that Alistair and I talked about at thecitadelcafe.com. Music for the show was composed by Kevin McLeod, and you can email us at thecitadelcafe at gmail.com. Subscribe for free on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and YouTube. Word of mouth is the easiest way to support the show. Just tell a friend about the Citadel Cafe and where they can go to listen to it. And of course, you can leave a rating or a review on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you're listening. My name is Joel Duggan, and you can find everything I am doing online, including my illustration and design portfolio at joelduggan.com. You can check out my other podcast, All About Minecraft, at thespawnchunks.com, and you can follow at Joel Duggan on social media. That, of course, points you towards Twitch and Twitter and all the places. But Twitch is where I spend a lot of my time. I stream Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and sometimes even bonus episodes. I did uh, a stream yesterday on Wednesday, so keep an eye out for that. Alistair, where can people find you online? Well, you can find me and everything uh, over at alistairmcfly.com. And as Joel mentioned at the top of the show, I have my own podcast, a Star Trek retrospective series called Long Range Sensors. And for our subscribers, we also have Subspace Live, where my co-host Trev and I will be nerding out in even more detail about all the geeky stuff uh, in the, the premiere of Star Trek Picard. So if you fancy joining us at the Final Frontier, you can listen to the show and find out more over at longrangesensors.com. You've been listening to the Civil Cafe, where we are fast, easy, and cheap, you can only beam up to. 